Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 175. This episode is with the fantastic Caroline Kermel. Not only is she a successful producer, but she's also genuinely one of the nicest people I've ever met. It was such a joy to get to hang out with her. In this episode, we talk about her moving a lot as a kid, where her interest in entertainment started, working her way from executive assistant all the way to producer, what it means to work in production, winning a Saturn Award for Star Wars Rebels, what it was actually like attending the Emmys, what it takes to make a good producer, and so much more. You are going to love her. So let's just jump right into this one. Please enjoy this episode of the Interesting Podcast, number 175, with Caroline Kermel. Theme song time. like what day is it it's Mm -hmm. a when you work nights and nothing makes sense you never know what day it is ever but weekends are your weekends just as busy as your week yes it's not busier because you try and pack in Mm. a week's worth of stuff all the errands you have to do yeah Yeah. oh are you good with free time i'm terrible i can't do it what I'm really trying to be good about is taking time for myself on the weekend ah, of just like sure. nothing, a nothing day. Yeah. I don't get out of the PJs. There's no plans. Like yeah. at least carving out one day a weekend for that. And does it work? Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's once a month instead of uh, uh, every weekend. There you go. You got to make yeah. it count at that point then. Yeah. Exactly. I'm right there with you, except I, I can't do it. I got, I like being busy. I find the thing that by being busy, I, I, I haven't reached the end of the candle yet. You know, mm-hmm. they say like, if you burn the candle at both ends is bad, but if you have right. a really big candle, <laughs> you know, who knows? <laughs> and I kind of live by that. You know, there's going to yeah. be one day where I'm just going to shut down, but that yeah. hasn't happened yet. So, so are you shooting through the night? Or so it- I, my survival job is I deliver uh, bulk orders of newspapers to stores. So I do like oh. grocery stores and gas stations and stuff. And I've been doing that for, dear God, almost 13 years. Wow. So I do that every night. And then I do acting gigs during the day. Jeez so, Louise. You know, when you have a dream, Caroline. Yes. You know, you sleep when you're dead. <laughs> I hear you. I hear yeah. you. Keep like, that's what, that's it. what I that's tell good. myself. Yeah, you yes. have to. Yes. You have to, you know? Yes. So I know, I forget, I know you're in California, mm-hmm. but are you, are you in LA? Uh, I'm in uh, Northern California. Gotcha. I'm in uh, Redwood City. Oh, nice, nice. Are yeah. you from there? Yes, born and raised in the peninsula. And then we moved to Redwood City because PDI DreamWorks used oh, to be here. Oh, got um, it. And then we just never moved. Why not if it's there? That's yeah. cool. What is that like? Because I grew up in Florida and it's a mm. very different <laughs> existence. <laughs> than California uh it's really good I I mean I love the area that's why I'm still here um but it can be funny when you're constantly running into people from your past oh LeBron's like you know uh, LeBron is my husband (laughs) he says uh you know everywhere we go you know somebody I'm like you know spend a lot of time in this area (laughs) and uh so there's a lot of like oh grocery store haven't seen you sure oh, sure a lot of that and then growing up uh my dad was a contractor and cool. a real estate broker so we moved every two years oh. we would flip houses so i've lived in like every town up and down the peninsula really yeah oh. so i think that was sort of my first entree into um you have to be a little outgoing because every two years I also changed schools. So if I was very shy and if I stayed shy, I wouldn't make new friends. Right. So it sort of pushed me outside my comfort zone. Interesting. It's almost like a military brat lifestyle. It is. Know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Except it was all in the same state. Yeah. That's nuts. And it was weird for a kid because 
the houses we lived in, it was like, it was never really our house because it was like, we knew we were going to flip it. Oh, so as right. a kid, it's like, don't touch that, yeah. you know, don't, <laughs> you know, don't scratch that. Um, sure. So it's very different now being an adult and having my own house and like, oh yeah, yeah, I can do what I want. <laughs> <laughs> you just, did you start as an adult, like measuring your height? in your own house you're like I can do this now no <laughs> I haven't but I've been doing it with my daughter perfect yeah perfect you got to make up for lost time yeah that's interesting was that something you had to develop like to go out going like did it take a little while to crack the code yeah I was really shy yeah. and um but it's funny when it came to the arts I wasn't shy so I loved oh. to do theater and I was a ballet dancer and so oh, when it cool. came to those things no problem. I could be in front of an audience, but um, in school, I was like really quiet. So um, the more I did the theater, the more it helped, you know, um, me a bit, be a bit more outgoing in life too. Interesting. Okay. I see the thread yeah. now where the, yeah. the interest in entertainment starts. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And I actually, I did, uh, uh, I, I did like movies and TV and Amazing. commercials as a kid. Oh, sweet. <laughs> uh, so uh, I always, yeah, I, I hate the word child actor. Sure. I feel like it has such a stigma because sure. I didn't have a stage mother by any stretch. Mm -hmm. It was like, I love this. So she supported it. Cool. So I was, that was really my first exposure to the industry because oh. being on set and seeing how everything works. Oh my God. As a There's kid, nothing like it. It was incredible. You know? So that's really where the love came from. And then I've always loved movies. I'll watch anything and everything, yeah. every genre. Um, and uh, it was like, oh, I want to be a part of that, you know, one day. Was it always in, like, did you want to be an actor or did you want to produce? Like, did you have a lane that you kind of really wanted to get into? I, I didn't have the confidence to be an actor. So I knew <laughs> early on, uh, I don't think I could be an actor as a career, but I really wanted to be a part of it. Um, and it wasn't until I was in college, there was this, um, panel of, uh, alums who were working in the entertainment industry that I made the connection of, oh, there's a business side to entertainment and I could do that. And so I'm still a part of it, but oh. I, there's not a spotlight on me sort of thing. Sure. Yeah. Were you, uh, organized as a kid? Because as a producer now, I feel like every producer I've ever met very type A, very organized, mm. like good at getting things done. Was that a thing as a kid as well, where you, you had like different folders for different things? Or did you also have to kind of grow that skill set? It's funny. Like last time we chatted, we were talking about having ADD. And I yeah. think I had it a bit as a kid. Um, <laughs> I still have it. I, yeah. I, um, because it was, it was sometimes hard to focus. And then I would hyper focus. Ah, uh, yeah. You so know, familiar. <laughs> <laughs> and um so that's what I've found even nowadays is mm -hmm. like sometimes it's hard for me to um to focus on doing a task but then when I get into it the whole world you know shuts down while I'm working on this budget scenario or whatever it may yeah. be yeah um but yeah as a kid I, I think I was a little scattered um and if you talk to my husband and my personal <laughs> life I'm probably still a little scattered and but what I think is that I put so much of myself into my work yeah. that that takes 99% of my brain capacity. And so I have 1% left for my life. Sure. And that's why I get dates and, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that bill was due or whatever it may be. But when it comes to my work, yeah. it's all buttoned up. You know what I mean? That's the goal, really. You know, you just <laughs> got to have at least one thing to to funnel it into. It's like, I found out about this thing called object impermanence. Have okay. you heard this before? Mm -mm. It's with people mm -mm. that have like ADD where if you're not looking at it, it doesn't yeah. exist. Oh, interesting. And I was like, oh, that makes a lot mm. of sense. There's a word for it. That's why yeah. like you have to have a list and like a schedule because if it's not there, you will 100% forget about it because you're thinking of everything else. That is totally me because right? I'm old school and I have a notebook and I need to write down things to do. Yeah. Caroline, here's Same. the task. Yes. Yes. And without that list, it's like, I feel like I don't have a grasp on everything I need to do. Yeah. Same. I yeah. literally redid, I just switched to iPhone recently uh -huh. and I had Android for, you know, as long as droids have been out. 
I have a to-do list and it has to be like, I can't open an app because I'll forget to open the app. It's like writing stuff on your hand. I'll forget to look at my hand. So it has to be in my face of like, what am I doing today? It's a weird thing. At work, um, my colleagues sometimes make fun of me because I use my browser as another to-do list. So I have like 30 tabs open (laughs) (laughs) because if I close it, I'll forget, like, I need to look at this document or do this thing. Yeah. And they're like, "Uh, Caroline, you know, that's running down (laughs) your machine and it's going to be super (laughs) slow, but I'm like, that's my system. That's right. I don't forget something. Challenge accepted. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) You got to do with what works for you and it's working. So, Hey, you know, who's to say? Exactly. I'll back you up. <laughs> <laughs> so you went, you said you realized in college, there was the business side of the entertainment industry, mm-hmm. which I'm sure you learned later on. It's actually more business in a lot of ways. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. <laughs> when you did that, did you, did you want to do producing or did you want to get in any way possible once you learned there's a business side? Any way possible. Yeah. I remember um, when I heard about DreamWorks being in the Bay Area and Redwood City, it's like, oh my God, it's my backyard. Um, I just kept applying and applying for anything just to get my foot through the door. And I eventually got a job as an executive assistant and I worked my way up at the company. Um, But I didn't, uh, you know, when I entered it, I said, oh yeah, I want to go into production, but I didn't really understand what that meant. Sure. You know, it's a good word. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, But it was like, as I got Um, as I spent the time there and got exposed to more and more, I realized, oh my God, this is exactly what I want to do and can do. All the skills, all the life skills I've built to this point are sort of preparing me for this. And um, so in some respects, every step of the way has been a lot of hard work, but it's also kind of come naturally to me as well, which I think is why I sort of I moved up pretty quickly at DreamWorks. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that like a lot of things that, you know, some of my peers struggled with for me, it was like, Oh, that's just the way I do it sort of thing. (laughs) And um, so I feel very, very lucky. What kind of stuff did you have to do as an executive assistant? Oh boy. Uh, (laughs) Everything uh, I imagine. A lot of calendaring um, of the phones, Uh um, you know, documents, schedules. Sure. Um, I have the greatest respect for executive assistants after Same. being one. It's the toughest job in the whole world. Um, it can be a no win situation. Someone's mm-hmm. going to be upset with you. You know, you're trying to serve the needs of your boss. And then it, yeah, it's just a very tricky, tricky role, but it is the greatest playground to learn Oh, I everything bet. you need for, you know, to, to do well in production, because so much of what I do as a producer is like customer service makes sense. And having those soft skills, you know, as an executive assistant, it's the same sort of thing. You're negotiating with another assistant for someone's time, um, how to deliver bad news to your boss. Ooh. I'm so sorry. The, you know, <laughs> the king suite at that hotel is not available, but you know, there is a beautiful uh, queen size with a view of the garden sort of thing. Oh, I already like, feel better about it. <laughs> <laughs> but knowing how to pitch things so that that person doesn't get upset. Uh, it, it started with my very first role. Interesting. That makes sense. That makes sense. And also it's got to be cool because you're seeing the inner workings of every part. So if you wanted to move up or do something differently, you know your options and how they operate. Okay. How long did you do that for? I did it for a year and a half. Nice. um, And then a role came up in production. And, uh, you know, it was one of those things where they kept telling me, oh, well, you can't get a production role until you have production experience. I was ah, like, wait a minute, I can't get that experience. <laughs> yeah, I can't get the experience until yep. you take a shot on me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I remember when they told me about it, I did a ton of research and I talked to uh, other coordinators who had had the role before. So I knew exactly going into that interview what it was, what I needed, Smart. skills. And then... Um, as an assistant, I just had a, um, you know, a regular Windows machine, but in production, you also need a Linux machine and you need to oh. know some command lines because that's how they ran the dailies. Gotcha. 
So what I would do is I would book the conference rooms that had these machines in there and I would just practice, you know, <laughs> pulling up things as fast as I could. Um, and then when I went into the interview, I was like super knowledgeable about everything. And I remember when they told me I got the role, it was like no one else prepared like you have. We were so impressed by how much you knew. And I was like, yes, win. Yeah. Uh, and so I got it. I got it. And it was a great first role. I, I loved everyone I worked with. I was really lucky. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love hearing stories. Luck is preparation meets opportunity. Uh, very good. Yes. Yeah, yes. I love it. And when you see, and that's, uh, that's something I feel like doesn't get talked about enough is the research and the work that you do when no one's looking. Yes. You know, it's, it's so we see the tip of the iceberg as success, you know, overnight success is 10 years in the making kind of stuff. Yes. But like, I think I just saw Rudy for the first time a few months oh, uh -huh. ago. Yeah, yeah. I'm a uh, 30 years late. <laughs> um, but what's crazy about that is, you know, I'd heard of it, but I was talking to my wife afterwards and just, you know, how great it was, obviously. And I'm like, it's fine. But oh, yeah. the, the part that really, really got to me out of that whole movie was him training by himself on the field. And so when his opportunity showed up, I'm like, nobody was even there. And he's running yes. into pads and rolling and doing the drills with nobody because that's how bad he wanted it. Yes. So it's I love hearing stories like that in real life. And you're like, this is what you want? All right, I'll see you in a second. I can't tell you how many times it's been true in my life. It's like how they always tell you, you know, when you're going for an interview, you should prepare like it's your final college exam. Yeah. And because you can tell what the type of questions you ask uh, and the type of things you talk about, whether or not this person actually read the job description, knows what they're coming in for. You know, there's nothing that's like uh, more of a, a downer when you get to the end, you're like, do you have any questions for me? Nope, nothing. It's like, yeah. dude, <laughs> think of something, you know? Right. And so my thing was, when I get to that part of an interview is I have something prepared that shows that I did the research. I really understand what I'm getting into. So it's like, oh, not only is that a good question, but you obviously, you care so much about this role that you did the preparation. Yeah. And there's been so many times in my career like that, just as you said, where it may seem like, why am I doing this? Why am I spending all the effort? Nobody can even see what I'm doing. It pays off eventually. I promise. Mm -hmm. so, Agreed. So yeah. That whole thing, hard work always pays off. It's not yes. always in the way that you imagined or expected yes. to, but 100% you get the return because yes. it, it accumulates. Yes. You just got to want it that bad. Yeah. And I look at my life and you know, it hasn't been linear. There've been Nobody's some detours, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and as you go on those detours, you think, you know, I'm never going to get past this. Oh my gosh, I'm going off the rails. I look back on it and every single one of those detours was the, the uh, perfect thing. It ended up yeah. being the perfect thing in my life. It all worked out, but I couldn't see it in the moment. It mm -hmm. took, you know, looking back on it now, everything led me to where I am now and I'm in such a great place. I'm so happy. So I feel like, um, yeah, a, a lot of people judge their journey. Like, Oh, I, I had to take a step back in my career. I, many a time you have to take a step back to take a step forward. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Can't run if you can't breathe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So then when you're doing, when you got your first role in production, what does that, mm -hmm. what does that mean for anyone that doesn't know? Oh, sure. So the production side is uh, the business side of um, entertainment. So it's um, the people behind the scenes making sure that something ends up on screen. Mm -hmm. So we're the ones in charge of the schedule and the budget and managing all the artists who work on what you see on screen. Mm -hmm. So my first role was working on a Madagascar uh, Valentine's Day special. Sweet called um uh madly madagascar amazing and um i so i was the coordinator um in redwood city cool. and it was a project that was being done in india for the most part oh and it was the only it was only the second project that we had worked with the india studio mm -hmm. so Caroline, who's super ambitious, was like, yes, this is amazing. This is the opportunity I needed because I can set up the whole pipeline and workflow and impress the sops out of everybody yeah. um, because everyone was still trying to figure it out. 
So um, I had a really good rapport with the art director, James Wilson, who I adore to this day, and um, the Via Fet Soup, um, Philippe Luckman, who was in India. Uh-huh. And so I think where people had struggled working with them, the, the India studio before, is because they didn't take the time to really get to know them and ask questions. It was sure. more about like, this is the way we work. And so you will match that. Mm. Whereas I really, I would spend a lot of time with Philippe asking questions um, and really trying to make it work. Like, what can we do on our side to make it easier for your team? Because yeah. they're the ones executing everything. Sure. And um, looking back on it again, it was like, that was the, I was so lucky to have that as my first role because a lot of coordinators, their first role is you're managing one department mm-hmm. and it's, you know, um, you have one lead that you talk to, but I had my hands in all the departments. I got to learn the whole pipeline and I got to learn what it's like to work with uh, a team that's remote. And yeah. that's sort of, that's become the future. You yeah. know, <laughs> True. Every, every project I'm a part of now, we have a core team that's here in the States, but mm-hmm. the majority of the work is being done by a vendor um, or another team that's somewhere abroad. So uh-huh. those skills were, you know, invaluable. Yeah. And you didn't even know a pandemic was coming. I had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> things, things accumulating. Yes. That's, were you scared? I mean, that's a big deal. And like to, to remote adds a whole other layer to it where you can't control it as best as you could have if you could walk into an office kind of thing, you know? Well, I would say I had amazing mentors along the way. Cool. And one of my first mentors was the producer on this project, Chris Leahy. Oh, yeah. I learned so much from him because um, I remember being very nervous about, um, you know, every, every little detail. Yeah. I, to, to my team, I would be, you know, super put together. Oh, yeah, it's fine. We're going to hit that. <laughs> but then I could vent to Chris. I'm so worried, you know, um, it looks like we're going to be two weeks late or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. And now as a producer, it's like, oh, that's nothing, you know, <laughs> <laughs> little baby Caroline, that's nothing to worry about. <laughs> but one of the great lessons I remember learning from Chris was um, to, to remain calm. Uh, that good skill. You know, he was like Buddha on the mountaintop about yeah. everything. I said, Chris, da, 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 da. And he's like, it's going to be fine. Uh, we, we have a plan. We have a backup plan. And he'd walk me through it. It, nothing at all would ever rattle him. Mm. And I remember later on, I asked him, like, how can you always be so calm if you don't mind my asking? <laughs> and he was the one who said, he's like, oh, Caroline, inside, I'm freaking out. I'm in a panic. <laughs> he's like, but you cannot sh- present that to your team. Yeah. Otherwise, they will freak out. You just think, okay, I've done this before. I will figure it out. There's always a solution. And that's a good producer. Right. If, uh, if the producer is panicked, the whole team's going to be panicked. <laughs> you yeah. know, so that was a great first lesson on my very first project. Yeah, be a duck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, yeah, if the captain says we're all going to die, it's not a good idea. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, that's so cool, though. Mentors make or break everything. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like that's the whole point of them is like you ascend with their help kind of the hierarchy of society. That's really yes. cool that you had someone like that. Yes. Along the way, I've had a, a lot of great mentors. And so something that's been really important to me is paying it forward. Yeah. So 100%. I always, every project I'm on, I try and teach someone under my wing cool. and, you know, teach them everything I've learned. And then it's like, fly, you know, you take yeah. this knowledge <laughs> and do what you want with it. But it's, it's one of the things that um, I actually love about my role too, because I get to do that a lot. Cool. And so there's seeing someone that you mentored blossom. Oh, oh yeah. It's the greatest thing in the world. It has to be. Yeah. That it's getting other people to live up to their true potential. Yes. I mean, it's magic, right? It is. That's so cool. Where did yeah. you go from there? Because I know you did, you said you started on a Madagascar short. Right. Uh, so after... I think I did another short. I think I did a How to Train Your Dragon. Um, oh, I see a thread here. A Christmas short. Okay. Um, okay. And then from there, I did um, Puss in Boots, where I met my husband. Nice. And I did um, Madagascar 3. 
And then I finally got promoted to supervisor for how to train your driving too. Cool. And that was a big, big moment for me because the leap from coordinator to supervisor was like a big one. Really? Because you went from sort of being in a similar role to when I was an assistant, mm -hmm. where you're sort of in service to the supervisor, both the creative and the production mm. supervisor. Sure. Where as a production supervisor now, I'm the leader. I'm the uh. one supervising the whole team of 50 creatives. Um, I'm in charge of my budget for my department. And these Ooh. are feature films. So it's millions of dollars you know, <gasps> that you're managing. Yeah. So you go from, you know, updating trackers and, you know, presenting <laughs> all this information to the supervisor to be the one now coming up with the plan, leading the charge. Ooh. So it, it was quite a, you know, it's quite a leap. Huh. How, do, do the skills translate? Like did the jobs prior prepare you adequately for the supervisor job? I think so. Yeah. And um, what I've seen with every company I'm a part of and everyone hates it, but it is what it is, is that you kind of have to be doing the next role for about six months before they actually give you the, the title and the promotion. Makes sense. So I was doing it for quite a while before it became official that I was a production supervisor. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I got to dip my toes in. And again, for me, it was um, very, I'm very lucky that it, it kind of came naturally. Um I think I'm kind of a maternal person and that is see it. a good skill as a producer um, because artists uh, can be a little uh, yeah. sensitive <laughs> and they need a little bit of, you know, hand holding and encouragement along the way. So it's good to have uh, a leader who has an empathetic ear. Um, and I feel like the production supervisors or producers that I know who have struggled it's sometimes there's a wall between production and the creatives. And that's when you struggle. You need to be able to have a dialogue. You need to be able to, to support them. You're still in that support role, no matter um, you know, what level you're at in production. You're always supporting your team. That makes total sense. And because creative is also creative, right? So you have yes. to be in a good mind space to create. And if you're being like, hit over the head all the time. You're like, ah, okay, I, yeah, I can draw this, I think. But you get so much better yeah. art when everyone is kind of operating under, oh, let's create. You know, yes. it's just environment. It seems totally. really important. Um, I, I've never been a fan of a producing style where it's like constantly reminding the artist, your, your deadline is Friday. You, yeah. know, you need to hit this. <laughs> that does not, as you were saying, you know, that's not conducive to a uh, a healthy creative environment. Right. I've always been like, let the artists do their thing. I'll worry about the schedule. I'm production. Sure. You know, and then if I have to, then I go to them. But of course, if, they'll know if I, I'm coming to them, it really is a last resort. I'm in a corner. I need sure. help. Like sure. we are, th things are bad. Sure. Um, <laughs> as opposed to, you know, sometimes producers are like, Every week, they're trying to keep people on on task. I've never, mm -hmm. that's never been my style. Sure. And I bet people love working under you for that very reason. I, I hope so. I hope so. I think, I think I have a, I think the team is happy. I can see it. I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you like the, the responsibility that comes with supervising? Because I feel like there's a, there's a pretty big jump from coordinator to supervisor as far as just sheer responsibility weight. Yes. Um, I did. Uh, but it's certainly, uh, it was scary. It was scary at moments because yeah, the expectations are higher. The, um, it, it's like everything is at a higher level. Sure. You know what the I caliber. Mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it's a lot more pressure because it, a lot of things are on you to solve mm, you sure. and you alone. Um, a lot of times I always, you know, I partner with my creative and it's like, let's solve it together. But at the end of the day, a lot of the stuff is production's responsibility to figure it out. Sure. Still your yeah. name on the sheet. Yeah. Like I remember um, we were working on penguins. Great. Uh, penguins of Madagascar. And this pulled up by three months. Uh, so that becomes, the schedule becomes extremely crunched when Ooh. you do this. <laughs> and I remember the producer said to me, Okay, so you need to come to me with a scenario of, of how to get this work done. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. You can't have more money. You can't have more people and they can't work overtime. Go. (gasps) And as a producer, like those are your first things you do. Okay. So if I can't have more time, I can at least staff up. So I have more people to do this work or, okay. If I can't get more people, I can have them work, you know, 10 hours of overtime every week to hit this. When you taped all those out, it's like, now I got to get super creative. Yeah. Yeah. What'd you do? Uh, so I immediately uh, connected with my creative supervisor. So I was um, managing the animation department at this time. So it was a huge group. Cool. There's a lot of pressure in animation. It's a really tough department. Yeah. So what we did was we went through all the sequences that we still needed to complete. Mm-hmm. And we got super creative of how to simplify the work but still Ooh. make it look good. So for example, um, we had a whole list of suggestions for the director, like this shot, instead of it being a full length of uh, this octopus with all these tentacles, yeah. let's just shoot him in you know, three shots from the waist up. So now we're just animating the face and we don't have to worry about all this other stuff. Oh, that cuts, you know, 10 man days. Yeah. So there are a lot of like cheats like that, like just pull the camera in a couple fields so we don't reveal as much. Um, or, you know, by pulling in the camera, now we don't have to animate all those characters in the background. They're not visible anymore. Oh. Sort of thing. Um, so we came up with a lot of solutions like that and it slashed a ton of the mandates. So we fit in the bots. Oh, and, wow. Uh, yeah. So we did it. We, we figured it out. And then of course the plan goes out the window yeah. <laughs> um, because I remember that the show had like three directors and um, one of the directors who was, um, he was our main director for animation. Mm-hmm. He was tough. And ah. so we try and like get things. Okay. Is this, is this approved? No, I want to see it again. It's like, Oh God. Uh, <laughs> okay, time, so, time. 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 Exactly. You know, we're like, you know, can we pull the camera in a field here? No, I like it the way it is. Like, Oh my goodness. Uh, 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 and, uh, <laughs> and then you go to your production leadership. It's like, you know, uh, you know I'm, I'm nervous that we were, we can't, we can't deliver. And it's like, figure it out figure yeah. it out so then we had to come up with new solutions you know oh. so it's a constantly evolving process and the people who can make it in production can adapt right you know okay plan a didn't work i got plan b c d e you know yeah. uh, and and you get these projects done they always eventually come out right so uh <sighs> trial by fire yeah that's wild that's really cool though yeah is it the same like a lot of people talk about because I can only speak from the acting side Mm -hmm. where whether you're doing like an indie short versus like a blockbuster, it's ultimately still an actor in front of a camera. Mm -hmm. Does Mm -hmm. the same thing translate in like shorts versus features in animation? Uh, So, so I'm working in TV now and I, I think the best comparisons between TV and feature. Mm -hmm. So feature, you have a ton of time. So these features you know, they take three to five years from development through delivery. Right. And it's for, you know, 80 minutes of content. Right. Right now I'm doing 40 episodes, you know, that are 11 minutes each. So, and we're on a much, and we have to do this in a year plus. (sighs) Um, So you are creating a ton more content in a much faster amount of time. (sighs) So it's just about uh, the level of detail and time you spend on things. So for gotcha. example, in feature, um, there'd be a lot of times where we were idle for months because mm. there was a screening and, oh, this character didn't test well. This scene didn't test well. We're going gotcha. back to boards. So you uh, have to wait for those new boards and then they have to be pitched and, and cut in and add um, an editorial. Sure. So you're in, you have an entire team just idle while you wait for this. And those were the things I never liked. I, I do like to, sure. to have work to do. Yeah. <laughs> in TV, it's like, we don't have time for that. You have to be super decisive and we have to constantly be moving forward. We can't, we don't have the time to take three steps back. And I love that about TV. Interesting. Okay. So I'd say, yeah, that's a big difference. That's 
I, that's a huge difference. Like <laughs> one, one, you can breathe a little. It's just a constant. That's a lot. Yeah. It's, wow. it's a lot. There's, there's never idle time when you're working in TV. There's always something to do. Sure. Yeah. When you're doing say like 40 episodes, are you mm -hmm. bouncing around? Cause like movies you shoot at a sequence or are you like, there's a sequence that you have to do this episode, then this episode, then this episode. So animation is pretty linear. Okay. Um, you, you can't start animation until you have all your cameras done. You can't ah, right. start, you know, uh, all your camera work until all the assets are finished. So it gotcha. is pretty, pretty okay. linear. Um, but what happens is we have like 10 episodes in production at the same time. Oh. So you may be final lighting on one and just storyboards uh, on another. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that's so that's why so you're much. constantly there's yes, there's a lot to do and, and trying to get your brain around. Okay, what am I looking at? Okay, so this is boards for which episode, you know, sort of thing. Yeah. Oh, and to be in charge of that is a, a chicken farm. You know, like, <laughs> that's wild. But I mean, hey, it's working. You're doing a good job. Yeah. Well, thank you. Wow. Thank you. What made you switch from DreamWorks to Lucasfilm then? So I was in Redwood City mm -hmm. and um, they close the studio one day. Oh, I will. I will never it. forget it. <laughs> um, have you ever seen the movie uh, Up in the Air? Uh -huh. uh, George Looney. Uh -huh. So I remember the day that they gave us the announcement. Uh, there was a weird vibe. And there of were course. some people we didn't recognize. And I remember I was going out to lunch. And these ladies arrived who were totally the George Clooney characters. They had the oh. little luggage and they were like the, the closers in case anyone goes nuts sort of sure. thing. And, uh, and then they brought us all into uh, like the main dining room. And I look over and I see all the ladies from HR coming and sobbing. And I was like, okay, Ooh. so I, I, I don't think this is good news. <laughs> I don't think this is good news. So they told us and um, a couple of us were lucky enough to get offers to go to LA. Gotcha. And work at the, the Glendale studio. Mm -hmm. So I was given an offer, um, but I had just gotten engaged and uh -huh. my husband had already left DreamWorks to work at um, Industrial Light and Magic, right. uh, part of Lucasfilm. Uh -huh. And um, so that was something keeping me here and my family is here. So actually between DreamWorks and Lucasfilm, I did a short stint in visual effects. Ooh. which is really intense that oh. I, I would not go back into that industry yeah. for me personally. It's, <laughs> sure. uh, it's its own it's, bullpen. Yes. Um, my husband's in visual effects and, and he loves it, but it, it wasn't for me. Sure. Um, so, but it was an amazing uh, learning opportunity. Yeah, uh, of course. And it was actually a great transition between um, feature with its slower pace mm -hmm. and then landing at Lucasfilm, which I was working in TV, right. visual effects, it was like, whoa, how fast you have to move and how, you know, quickly things change. Um, it was training ground for working in TV. Ah. So, uh, yeah. After I did visual effects was when I started working on Star Wars Rebels at Lucasfilm. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Okay. How was that taking on like, you know, an IP that is arguably the biggest, but, and also it was a few seasons yeah. in as well, right? Yes. I started working on, I think the end of season two, uh, learning the star Wars universe. Cause I, I oh, I'm yeah. a fan. I know yeah. things, <laughs> uh, lowercase or capital. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I didn't know diddle, uh, sure. you know, and everyone is, um, uh, a fan and an expert sure. at Lucasfilm. Yeah. <laughs> so I remember being in these meetings and, you know, Dave Filoni is like, let's add a Transocean here. Sure. <laughs> that sounds what, nice. What in the world is that? And, you know, so I'm immediately, I'm on, you know, Wikipedia immediately <laughs> sure. looking it up. And I'm like, oh, I know what that, okay, now I got it. Sure. Sort of thing. But that was like the, the steepest learning curve was all the inside Star mm. Wars knowledge and unless you're like a super fan that sure knows you know the names of every world every character right uh, that was a challenge <laughs> understandable it's a pretty big universe it is it is is the workflow any differently as far as like from a producing side 
with working at like DreamWorks versus Lucasfilm because it's a different ecosystem because it's a mm-hmm. different company. Did it translate? It did. Um, so Lucasfilm is part of Disney. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's kind of a unique situation because it's a smaller company. Uh, it, at least Lucas Animation is a, a smaller piece, but you're part of this giant company of Disney. Right. So when I joined, you know, it had been a couple of years since the, the Disney buyout mm-hmm. and, you know, they had a very unique way of working and it had worked all through Clone Wars. They had this pipeline sure. and there were a lot of things they had to adapt to the Disney methodology. Uh-huh. And um, so that was a challenge. We were still trying to find our balance of what we used to do in Clone Wars that worked so well mm-hmm. and following the, the Disney way. Um, gotcha. And, and we did, we, we got there and, um, uh, the pipeline is super strong now, Yeah. but I was cool. there where it was still, you know, a bit of a transition. Sure. Still building said pipeline. Yes, exactly. I mean, Hey, it worked. You won a Saturn award. Congratulations. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Thank pretty you. cool. <laughs> it's a pretty cool one. It is. It, it's a beautiful trophy. I, I feel so honored. Where, where, where does it, where did you put it? Where does it go in your house? So we have a little like trophy case. Cool. Uh, I say in you. quotes. Yeah. <laughs> and um, in the trophy case is the Saturn Award. Um, cool. It also has awards I've made for my husband along the way. I love he's it. An effects artist. So yeah. there is a gold transformer uh, that says best smoke. <laughs> best smoke. <laughs> I love uh, it. Things like that. And then now it's been taken over with crafts from my daughter's right. preschool. Children. So, children. Yeah. So it's it's a, a range of trophies that are I love in it. the case. That's what you need. You can celebrate anything you want, Caroline. Yes. I support it. Thank you. <laughs> Honestly, just as valid. You know, you got macaroni art yes. and a Saturn Award. Yes. Equal, in my a opinion. Totally equal. Yes. Yeah. I'm into it. One is slightly heavier. I'll give you yes. that. Yes. Yes. One could be used as a weapon. That's the only that is difference. That's very true. You know? <laughs> what I also know, I know you guys were nominated for an Emmy. Mm-hmm. So you got to go to the Emmys. Yes. How is that expectation versus reality? Um, there's a lot of walking. Really? <laughs> there's a lot of walking. So um, to get to the red carpet, uh-huh. uh, you have to, I mean, at least when... I went, you have to walk at least a couple miles. So, I mean, I'm sure the celebrities get <laughs> dropped sure. up, but for all of us uh, normal folk, right? We, to all, we were funneled through this garage, through through this couple blots of street, and then you eventually land in this area that leads you to the red carpet. And it's hot because it, you're like in this tent. Oh, so yeah. it's like, okay, now let's all take pictures on the red carpet. When were we ever going to be on the red carpet again? Sure. And I'm dre- you know, drenched in sweat. <laughs> I had had my hair done and it's becoming super curly and frizzy. I was like, oh, <laughs> this is not my Emmy experience from my um, <laughs> dreams. Right. Um, but, uh, but then, okay, so then you get inside and uh you go in your seat and you hear about the seat fillers yes i i knew about it but i don't know i it was quite a shock to me just how much they are constantly going in and out of seats oh so it's like you know they start the ceremony um and you know all these celebrities come out to present it's like oh my god that's that's you know that's brian cranston and um so we were freaking out and um but then all around you, as people are getting awards, there, there's the producer of the Emmys going, okay, you sit here. And so there's constantly flooding in oh. people um, uh, who are the, the seat fillers. So there's just, basically, there's a lot of commotion in the audience that I wasn't huh. expecting. I thought I'd just sit and watch the show. No, there's a lot of commotion. I did. I guess I never thought about that. The rotating. The, yeah, a lot of rotating. I've heard of seat fillers, but I imagine they like, plant them and then they're there for the show yeah me too no. huh yeah wow that's pretty neat yeah but it, it was really cool was it a long ceremony uh, i want to say it was at least an hour and a half maybe two hours okay not, yeah. not terrible yeah not terrible just enough to be memorable yeah it was 
I, I felt so privileged to, to be there because the thing about being a producer is I'm one person. Right. It's a team sport every step of the way. Sure. So it's like, I'm so privileged that I get to have a Saturn award. I get to go to the Emmys. Yeah. But there is an entire team of incredibly talented artists who make the show. And so it's just a shame to me that, you know, that can't be shared. I, I get it. it. You know, a team of hundreds of people, they can't all sure. go to the Emmys. Right. But um, it's, uh, you know, it, it, I'm very privileged to be in the position I am that I got to experience these incredible things from my dreams yeah. um, when I'm really just representing an entire team that is making, you know, these shows. Sure. And I think that says a lot about you because you're like accepting it on behalf of everyone as well as your work. Like that's, right, right. that's cool. Cause there are people that do not do that. <laughs> <laughs> they do not. That's right. That's really neat. Like I, yeah. I know uh, Roger Deakins just got knighted. A yes. few days ago. And his whole thing was like, I'm getting knighted, but it is a team. This is for everybody. Right, so, right. So you have that in common with Sir <laughs> Roger Deakins. Oh, Congratulations. my God. Oh, I love him. <laughs> I adore him. He's amazing. Yeah. So no, from there, now you're at Warner Brothers? Now I'm at Warner Brothers. Cool. Yeah. How do you like it? Oh, I love it. I yeah. love it. I'm working on, um, and now I can actually talk about it a little bit. I'm working oh. on a project <laughs> called uh, Bat Wheels. Oh, cool. And it's kind of like a Batman meets cars. Amazing. Uh, sort of thing. And uh, it's for preschool. So it's cool. a show that my kid can actually watch and enjoy. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I just love it. I love my team. I'm, I'm really lucky. That's cool. Is it still the the skills are translating, you find, over the course of what you're doing? Like, as a producer, do you think you could plug into most productions and it still works? You should. Uh, yes. Yes. Ideally. <laughs> I always say, you know, whether you're producing TV, film, even video games, like, it's all the same skill set. Even yeah. a project manager, you know, uh, for tech or something it's a lot of the same skill set so you should be able to do it the sure. thing that's different about preschool is we have a lot of eyes on us uh, you know they, they're expecting sure. really big things from this show right uh, and there are um you know like a lot of rules we have to follow to make the show appropriate sure. for kids mm, makes sense so you know uh at lucasfilm someone can be decapitated with a lightsaber cool right. <laughs> uh since this show is geared towards you know for it has to be appropriate for four-year-olds mm, sure you have to make sure that a lot of the behavior is not imitatable that's what they tell us imitatable uh, that makes sense and so you have batman who's on a rooftop and it's like well a kid might climb up to a rooftop. So right. can you stage that somewhere else? And it's sure. like, but it's freaking Batman. Right. Why can't he be on a roof? Right. So um, He loves roofs. Yeah, it's totally. <laughs> uh, so it's a lot of things like that where we're having to get really creative again so that we uh. you know, follow all the rules. Because at the end of the day, if we don't follow the rules, they just won't air the show. Right. We, have to, we have to follow them. Sure. So it's a lot of making sure that we um still make the show cool enough that mom and dad who are huge dc fans right will want to watch it with their kid mm -hmm. um but also that it's safe enough where um like we say if if mom needs to take a shower and the kid mm -hmm. is in front of the tv watching the show she knows they're safe there's nothing there that's right really appropriate um and mom could take a little break <laughs> right she won't come out with them running with a knife you know, exactly <laughs> exactly yes <laughs> Okay, that makes I, I never would have thought about that. Yeah, that's a good point. And as a kid who watched Power Rangers, my brother and I were kicking the mess at each other <laughs> all the time, jumping yeah, off of everything. Yeah. <laughs> I was very influenced. I remember by the the shows and the movies I watched. Yeah, a lot of imitation. Yeah, I mean, honestly, still. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like I don't smoke, but that does look kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah well they always make them look so cool when they're smoking they do. you never see someone who's not cool smoking exactly yeah. you know what ah, yeah, we'll figure it out <laughs> yeah <laughs> what do you think now having done this for so long is like 
a core skill that a producer needs like the the basic like this screwdriver works for almost everything you have to be able to talk to people mm. and that's the 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 empathy part for your artists yeah it is the being able to present to your bosses like for example on the show i'm on right now uh the president of one of others is very involved Ooh. so <laughs> it, yeah it's a lot of pressure <laughs> and being able to have a meeting with him and communicate, you know, where the show is at. Um, mm -hmm. So all levels of people being able to confidently talk to them. Um, so everyone stays calm, just as calm yeah. as I am as the producer. <laughs> right. And everyone feels like, okay, this show is on track. Um, I don't need to worry about anything. So, you know, you have to be able to talk to people, your, your artists, your production team, keeping them motivated. Um, you know, when you start out in production, you make nothing. It, sure. It, it's the one that thing works. I, I really wish would change about our industry, but mm -hmm. those entry level roles, you make nothing. Yeah. And so to keep a team inspired, um, it, it, it takes a lot of work of, you know, seeing the strengths in your team and, and motivating and encouraging. And because the only reason you would take an entry level production role is because you see a path for yourself. I want to be a producer or right. I want to be a creative. Um, so finding out what your team wants to do and then guiding them there, mm -hmm. that's how you keep them motivated. So again, it's talking to them. I right. have a lot of check-ins every week. Cool. That's that's the one thing I, I tell all new producers, lots of check-ins. Yeah. <laughs> have face-to-face -face time with your team. Don't chat them. Don't email them. Make sure you have regular time with your team. Sure. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's all being able to talk to people, I think. Okay. That makes sense. What's something that's like a common pitfall that maybe you can help someone avoid on the journey? Mm. I think uh, taking things personally. Ooh, good one. It is um, very easy to take things personally because yeah. we spend sometimes more of our life working with our peers on these projects mm -hmm. than with our own family, right? Your blood, sweat, and tears are going into these shows. Sure. Um, in movies, whatever it may be, just as you know, with your projects, it's, it takes every bit of you. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. The folks that I've seen struggle and sort of burn out are because as things go wrong, as they inevitably do at some point in production, something goes yeah. off course. Yeah. They take it to heart and um, they don't realize it's a business. At the end right. of the day, it's a business. Always. And you have to look at it this way. Yes, I am so connected to my spreadsheet. I right. did such a great <laughs> job. I'm so proud of it. But if my boss doesn't understand how mm. I track things, I just change it. No biggie. Sure. Whatever. Um, whereas, you know, someone else may be. Uh, no, that, my way is, is the right way. I can't believe that they would, you know, give me comments <laughs> or feedback. Sure. So being able to take feedback is a huge one. Right. You're constantly getting feedback every single day from somebody. Right. Everybody has an opinion on how to make these shows. Mm -hmm. um, and the producer is sort of the hub, the customer service again, you know, the right. hub of all everyone's complaints. From sure. the highest level <laughs> to, you know, to the kitchen. Sure. Somebody has a complaint <laughs> and they're going to come to you. So being able to process it and not look at the feedback as you're doing something wrong. Uh, it's just like they're coming to you because they know you will help get a solution. Right. You will help find a solution. So um, if you can distance yourself a little bit and not take all of that personally, sure. you'll be a great producer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Is there, so like on the, I'm more familiar with like the indie film side of things mm -hmm. and like with producing is most of the stuff that you're doing at your level in house and it's about keeping your house operating or is it about getting outside things as well? Ah, so uh -huh. it is everything. <laughs> ah. So there's, <laughs> there's our team here, which is, that's one piece. Uh -huh. There is our vendor overseas uh -huh. doing a lot of the work. That's another piece. There is the huge marketing consumer products end that we have oh. to work with. Uh, there is the studio leadership that we have to keep happy and 
show that we're on track. Uh, the the list goes on and on. But you, you service a lot of different people. Oh, I'm stressed <laughs> yeah. just hearing about it. <laughs> it. It's it's not that bad. It's um, you just have to be able to manage it and and again not take it personally and just right. take it step by step. Um, but what, what stinks sometimes is like, okay, I just figured out this piece. The vendor is happy. They're working we're all sure. good. Oh no. And now there's a problem. The leadership's not happy. They Ooh. want a change. Okay. I got that figured out. Oh, now my team is having a meltdown. Okay. Let me, right. so you're constantly <laughs> like every week, somebody is not happy. Sure. And, uh, it's just about figuring it out. That's all. Persevere. Yes. yes. Yeah. Get some, get some tough skin. Yes. Persevere. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You re you really need a uh, tough skin. That's the the piece about not taking it personally. If yeah. you have your armor on, mm -hmm. and when I'm mentoring someone who wants to be a producer, I'm like, when you go into those meetings, whatever it may be, it's with the leadership, or you know, you have to have a tough conversation with someone on your team. Sure. Go in with your armor on. Mm -hmm. Be ready. There may be personal attacks. There may be you know sure. the unexpected. And uh, just if you have your armor on, you're good. You can, you know, whatever they say, it's not going to hurt. Sure. It's, a, it, it's human responses. This is how yes. it works. <laughs> it's yeah. called a reaction. All right. <laughs> We're going to be all right. <laughs> yes. Yes. When you're working your way up, I imagine mm -hmm. producer was, was kind of the goal for a mm -hmm. while. Yeah. Now that you are one, does it, mm. how does that feel? Because I, I love talking to people who like achieve their dreams and I'm like, what's yeah. it like, you know? <gasps> I have to say it's wonderful. Yeah, it is. Cool. Um, it it feels great, and I feel like oh, I can kind of, yeah. you know, breathe a little bit because so much of my career was trying to get to this point. Yeah. So now that I'm here, it's like I can kind of enjoy, and that's why I let, like we were saying, um, when all of these issues come up, I can kind of let it just roll off of me. Sure. Because I'm very happy where I am, both in my professional life and my uh, personal life. I, love I, I have a family now. That was my personal dream. Yeah. Um, and uh, I feel like, you know, I, I kind of got this right now. Everything's yeah, you good. Do. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. I love when good things happen to good people. And even Thank more you. so when they earn them. <laughs> like, oh, there was so a much. journey. That's amazing. Thank is you. producing is this is this where you're at this is where the fulfillment is like you don't have any else you anywhere else you want to go i've thought about you know maybe eventually taking like more of a studio role Ooh. because of how production is so intense sure i don't know if i can do it forever sure sort of thing. <laughs> it's fair you are and human <laughs> i am human uh whereas you know a production role i could still be uh sorry a studio role um I can still be involved in these projects, but you know, you're at like a higher level. Right. And so you're not in all those details. So all the, sure. all the complaints that are coming in will right. <laughs> hopefully not be as many. <laughs> I'm sure there's a new set of problems that come along with being student. There always leadership. are. Yeah. Um, but that might be something I'd explore in the future, but right now I'm, I'm so happy where I am Good. and being remote has been a life changer. I for bet. Me because I had my daughter, you know, at the peak of COVID. Ooh. And then I started working at Warner Brothers and I didn't miss a single milestone with her. Cool. You know, I got to see everything. She was in her crib next to me yeah. you know, for the longest time. Now she's in daycare. Sure. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Cause she's a little wild right now. She's at that Perfect. You know, walking, running yes. stage. Um, but yeah, I, I got to hear her first word. I, oh, I saw, cool. saw everything and it's just been amazing. So I love the new, um, yeah. remote lifestyle, you know, maybe one day, you know, having a hybrid schedule could be cool going in mm -hmm. a few days a week to meet with your team. Sure. But, uh, right now I'm, I'm totally loving the remote life. Good. Good. I'm glad. I always like it when people survive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So a little bit of an adjustment for some, mm -hmm. and that's good. I'm very, I'm very glad. I think that's super cool. And it, you're, you're killing it. You're killing it. Oh my fronts. gosh. You know, thank you. I'm saying you're alive. That's a great, <laughs> great first that step. Is. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and then to thrive is the goal and you're doing both very well. And I just think thank that's you. great. 
Thank you so much. But hey, we've been talking for over an hour, Caroline. Oh, that flew by. You survived. I did. <laughs> Thank you. You never know at the beginning how these things are going to go. Right. <laughs> you are a joy. This is oh, and you so too. Great. This oh, was such it. a pleasure. Oh I'm my gosh. That out. <laughs> well, before I release you back into the wild, mm -hmm. I gotta ask where can people mm -hmm. find you online? Where can they find your things? Uh, let's see, let's see. Uh, so uh, I have, well, you know what I always say is um, uh, I have my LinkedIn. Ah, smart. And I really try and uh, respond to um, anyone who reaches out to me for guidance or whatever cool. it may be. So uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I, I have a, a child, so please be patient <laughs> with me. I may not reply right away, but I really do try and reply to everyone. Sure. Um, and then I have a, a Twitter as well, uh, Caroline Kermel. Perfect. Get that SEO. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And... Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at brianbalance.com. There you'll find my demos, films, and a bunch of other really fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to pick you up some sweet gear. Also, I've made a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly and get early releases of the shows, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Daryl, Daz, Ben, Victor, Jim, and Chris. Your support means so, so much to me, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well. <laughs>